Alright, welcome back if you're even watching. Um, this is episode 11 of A Minute with Mud. Mud's Shattered Operating System Phase 4. Since last video was pretty long, I'm not going to do a clarifier. Well, I'll do a quick clarifier because once I was in Hood River volunteering at the senior center, someone had had a son that I guess I had reminded her of, and he had died. He was homeless and traveler, and he had died. And so they, she wanted to bring me to Seaside, Oregon. So we went to Seaside, Oregon for about a week, and I got to hike the Pacific Crest Trail a little bit, and there was a hiker's camp that had uh, take what you need, leave what you can. And so I left some cans of tuna and I took a, a sleeping bag. That It wasn't waterproof, but it was a good one. Um, so that was pretty neat. I hiked to, through to Cannon Beach and then back. I think it was like 30 miles in 24 hours. Trying to clear my mind of everything that me and my younger girlfriend had been going through and all of the pressures from that one um, the book what the book that I read when I was in jail was a uh, fault of is fault of our fault in our stars um, so that one and also yeah I didn't share that link but so this morning I woke up to and I had a meeting with my sore advocate for applying for SSI, which people have been telling me for years and years and years to apply for that. I don't really agree with it. I don't feel like I need it. I don't want it. I don't want to be on assistance as much as I need to be, any more than I need to be. But we were going over some history and I also was able to look at my income and taxable income from 1997 on till this last year. And last year was actually the most I ever made in one year on paper, which was 6,800. And I, you know, I made more than that before, but so it was interesting to see the, the years that had zero written in it. A lot of the time after 2007 and my coma, I didn't have much income um, so I, anyway after that after she left I my body just started shaking uh, like a trauma release or something I I mean I th I felt fine inside but my body was shaking like crazy so I went and took a Scottish shower and if anybody knows about Scottish showers those are when you have a really hot shower and then you finish with with cold and having cold showers is a real thing. It's healthy for you. If you've ever heard about Wim Hof, they call him the Ice Man. He climbed a mount of like Denali or a few mountains like in his shorts. And he does a lot of cold water stuff. And, and they, they hooked him up to machines and show how colder water helps with the inflammation and all that kind of stuff. So that's sort of like the SAD disorder, seasonal depression disorder where all of our bad bacteria is dying because it's winter, it's cold. I mean, in the cold months too, they say there's happier people in the colder climates. Um, so, you know, that has a lot to do with it. And a lot, a lot of people eat a lot more carbs during the winter time to feed the bad bacterias and things like that. So intermediate fasting and keto Keto is a really good thing. With the cold showers helped me. I was the only reason I was able to heal as well as I did last year, or you know, last year around this time was because of daily enemas. Like I did enemas all every day, almost every time after I ate, and so I wasn't building a healthy gut biome, a sustainable one. But I did flush my system so clean and so well that my gut started to heal. And then after I had met someone and drank again, it didn't take long before it, that went away. 
but our bodies know what to do. So I went to celebrate recovery tonight. This is a, the shirt. I kind of like the design. The back is just North Dakota and all that. But um, one of the pastors there, he, he did, it's a pretty cool design. It reminds me of uh, the Harley Davidson one. So no shame in wearing that. Um, I'm in my bedroom. This is my favorite blanket, just a little one that I found at the Red Raven co coffee place where it's like, leave what you can, take what take what you need kind of situation there too. Um, I wanted to show you when I went to the Recovery Reinvented and the Behavioral Health Conference in November, I volunteered and got this shirt. And I like what it says because people have given me so much trouble talking about my issues and being wide open so many times about it and they just don't want to hear it. And it's like nobody wants to hear all this bad, bad stuff and stay positive and only think positive thoughts. Well, that's more of a pollution than anything anymore. You can't just say be happy to somebody. They have to clear what's giving them problems. And without talking about it, um, how are you going to do that? The one thing that the pastor that designed this, Aaron's his name, from the Lighthouse Church, I don't think he would mind me sharing it, um, but he told me, I told him I wanted to go to the peer support specialist training again so that I could refresh myself. Because I did save some of the book stuff because I had everything in my backpack. That's all I could was carrying around with me, everything I had, um, but until it got sto stolen from public locker rooms, bike the bike ones. And I didn't, all I got back, I got the tent back that my dad had given me, but nothing else. So my Mike Love shirt and those kind of things. You know, it's what I've learned about attachments, especially after my coma, is when I lost something, maybe I'd feel bad about it for a day or two. Um, but, I, you know, imagine no possessions, like in the John Lennon Imagine song. Imagine no possessions. I mean, I wonder if you can. You know, that really made a lot of sense. So I was able to let go of that stuff. Um, but what he told me about you know, because I can't take the peer support specialist again because I had already passed the training. Uh, he said to look into motivational interviewing. And so I did a little bit, um, but I liked it because you can ask people the right questions or just have them speak for themselves. And tonight at group, after um, the big group where there's like a... a, a Discussion and today we we're, you know, they had all these little sheets and stuff, and so it's uh, it was, what was it hope? Yeah, on hope. <laughs> and so they say higher power, openness to change, power to change, and expect. No, this isn't the one. I don't know. The the one was on turn. One second. Nope, I don't have it. No, it was yeah, it was on turn. Trust, resist, or something like that. I don't, I don't know. Um, but it was basically turning your power over to God and higher power stuff. And you know, I have my views on those things, so spirituality and all that. A lot of people have a really hard time identifying with what my thoughts are. I had some incense going. Um, but that's kind of what I've been doing with these videos is to just remain vulnerable. Um, Dare to Lead is a great book by Brene Brown that talked about how some of the most powerful leaders are the ones that are actually open and real with people. 
So I don't know what's going to happen or anything. Um, and tonight on phase four, I left off with um, breaking up with that younger ex that I met. She just turned 23 today, so, you know, she, she actually called me. She's having a hard time with her birthday. But, um, it's pretty close to my heart still. It's difficult. Um, but anyways, I was living with my mom. And I was getting healthy. I had a good job doing framing. And I had... I was looking for a new computer on Amazon. And so I decided to... Um, you know, they had this Amazon card, say $50, so I applied for it, and all of a sudden I got this $3,500 credit card in the mail, and I was like, oh, I better capitalize on this. And I totally disagree with those credit card people. I would not pay, if anybody has credit, I wouldn't pay the freaking credit card companies a penny. They make money out of thin air, and then they screw your life over with it. I mean, so money's bad enough. I mean, don't take my advice if you don't want to. <laughs> Um, but anyway, I got, so I had, you know, applied for a whole bunch of credit cards and, and got, I can't remember the exact amount, like almost 10000 plus the job that I was working for, I was getting good money from that. And so I started to get back to my health. I went vegan again. I was cleansing my system, drinking a lot of lemon water and, you know, kimchi stuff and you know, this is way before the humor worm. I mean, that's when I learned about it later on. No, that's not exactly when I learned about it. But crushed garlic, crushed garlic. Uh, they have x-rays of your system if you eat it on an empty stomach and your whole internals lights up. And so it probably lights up because it's getting rid of the bad bacteria. And, you know, if you haven't learned yet, it's going to be evident eventually it's starting to come out much more in the mass mass the mainstream of us only being 10 percent human and 90 percent bacteria or a foreign entity not human cells so those human cells have that amount of dna in them well the 90 percent of non-human cells also have that um, same amount of dna in them so our dna is mostly not human um, so it's kind of like a battle in a survival sense um, so I was getting really healthy I started doing push-ups I started getting healthy and after I left that trauma bonding relationship I well beforehand we had gone off and on you know that I mentioned the cheating and my alcoholism my attitude we would fight a whole lot um, you know, my mom had to do, had to see some of that. It was, I'm not proud of any of it. Um, but during that time, I thought about, well, what if I wanted to have a baby? So I kind of used the manipulation of saying, I want to have a baby. Let's stay, stay together. And and but it was real. I was like, hmm. Like I, I guess now I feel like maybe I do want to have a baby I don't know I was like 34 or 5 and I think 35 and then I thought to myself well what would I even name the kid you know if it was a son or something I think I can't she had the, the woman's the girl's name picked out so there was no going against that uh, some kind of color like teal or I can't remember but I thought Oliver. I thought I would, if I had a son, why not Oliver? That'd be a good name. Okay. Well, after she left, went back to Hood River. And, you know, like I said, it was a real disheartening. It was a hard situation for the both of us. But it was time, you know, and there's time when you have to get away from each other. There's times when you can just have to separate. And I remember her, you know... She still, she still thinks about me, that kind of stuff. And I mean, I wish everybody well. I wish all of them well. And I've made my amends. I've made my amends either to them or to somebody else. So I feel clear, much 
very pretty clear. It's more of the self worth issues that I've been dealing with. So, you know, because of being told you're a worthless piece of shit, like your father for most of my childhood. Uh, I guess it just stuck, it sticks with you, you know, when you're hypnotized up until seven or eight. Um, and then, you know, you get to think for yourself, but. Okay, so I was in my mom's basement and I was really lonely. I was really depressed. I was getting healthy. I was happy. It was like on up. And then I wanted to just self-sabotage everything. I wanted to kill myself. I was like, fuck it. I have all this money on cards and cash. Fuck it. And then there was a, a marijuana rally downtown and I was walking and I was listening to Risk It by Nako from Medicine for the People. Okay. And I turned the corner and Nako from Medicine for uh, Risk It was playing and I was hearing it in my headphones and singing it because I used to walk around singing a lot. That was my thing to release, uh, you know, anxieties and frustrations. Sometimes it, it created more frustrations because of the type of music I was singing. I remember years back when I was staying with my cousin, um, when I was with my PhD off and on, uh, I was singing real rough music and somebody from the bar, I remember a girl saying, why don't you sing something more positive? So I would sing that one day song from Mishugiria, Mishuga. Um, but so I was, yeah, I was listening to that song. And right when I turned the corner, the words from the, them playing the music there and the ones that I was listening to were exactly matched. And I was like, risk it. And I was thinking, what? That is insane. Because I was nervous to go to this rally. Like, it's a valley city. Everybody knows everybody. And I didn't want to be like, what the hell? You know, I mean, I support weed and the legalization of it. Um, being a pot zombie is not healthy. Um, CBD is way better for you anyhow. Um, um, so then I went and I had a Facebook friend. He's not my friend at all anymore. It's kind of a nemesis situation. Um, so I met him and then my most recent ex, which I'm kind of leaning towards referring her to as a junkie because that's how the mentality was. It was junkie. And whether or not you're using needles or not, I think I've referred to people that are just addicted, addicted, addicted to junkies. They're, it's a, you're a junkie, you know, in my opinion. So hate all you want. Anyway, I met her there and I had already been friends with her on Facebook because I just friend people in the area and um, suggested friends as well. So a couple days later, it was that was on 420, they did that. And I think it was the next day, I messaged her and asked her if she would like to go on a, for a heart to heart, on a heart to heart, or have a heart to heart conversation just to see if we you know we would get along at all and I had a joint and stuff so you know it's really tough to get weed in little shitty valley valley shitty anyway um and the corrupt cops there it's just I don't need to get into that um so she picked me up and I was waiting at the store for her to come and pick me up. And I was like, just go, dude. Like, I was getting messages like, this isn't gonna be good. I was getting that same gut feeling from when I met my younger ex um, to not go there. And at that time, I had no contact order with her and she, and she had placed it on me. It wasn't the judge. And, you know, um, a little while later, she had had it taken off of me and then wanted to meet up with me and stuff. So that, that's a whole nother, like, leave me alone. Please help me. Uh, God help me. I don't know what's going on. What am I doing? You know, and I was also very, very suicidal. Very. And so right before I was about to leave and say, fuck it, and go home, she pulled up. And I went into her car and it was full of trash, like any meth head's car would look like. And 
so I kind of brushed that red flag off, like, oh, well, okay. And I'm talking, like, packed. Um, anyway, we drove around, smoked some weed, talked, and talked and talked. For, like, two days, I spent money on breakfast and paid for the gas, and we just kept talking. And so I thought, okay... Um, I'm going to see this girl again and again and you know obviously it was unhealthy and obviously I made my original uh, you know this just because like I know you're crazy if you're with me because I'm in a crazy state of mind right now and if you're you know we, when you align like attracts like kind of thing and then opposites attract in it's the same concept just different directions and um so a couple days later, a few days later, and I, I met up with somebody that I hadn't seen in a long time. I grew up and knew him. He's from Valley City, but I, I, I grew up in Fingal. But when I meet Valley City, and he, his mom was a friend of the family, and my dad and mom and stuff. So every time I seen him, it was like an automatic, we'll have to party. And so I went and did some meth with him. And then later on, like the next day, I decided to buy some. and Because I had done meth, coke, different drugs that I wasn't addicted to them or anything. I just, I, it was easy to walk away from. Anything but alcohol was easy to walk away from. And so I was going to buy some. And so I went into the bar to get some money off my card. And I came back out and she had already paid for it. So that's when I knew she was into it. So she was down. She was down to be, you know, let's die together kind of situation, right? And... Oh, uh, you know, I think that night or a couple nights, I don't know. No, we had already made love for the first time before the meth. And things worked out because that was my thing. I wanted to make sure that, you know, we were sexually compatible to begin with, which is something I'm not doing anymore. I'd rather wait two to three months to find out if we're compatible before we just hook up. I mean, I really, I don't find value in it. I just don't. I've, I've had offers plenty to where it's like, no, no thanks. I'm not going to give my light because that shit means something to me. It should mean something to anybody. I mean, that's what creates a kid. That's what, you know, you're supposed to be having a family and all that. But, you know, I, this whole polyamorous thing and stuff, I tried last year. Not, not happening. Um... So anyway, we just started doing meth, and she's like, would get upset if I burned it wrong, because, you, you know, I burned the part you burn. I like doing lines anyway, because, screw that, Bernie, it was last longer, it was more powerful to me. I had snorted plenty of pills in my day. So I did a lot of different things like that, but... So then I just stayed with her, and my mom was like, oh, I don't know about this. And I was like, Mom, I'm so dead right now. Like, I am just, I, like, I'd, re I was throwing everything away, all of it, the money, everything. I knew she had a, a five year old daughter at the time, living with her mom, that kind of stuff. But I didn't know much about her. I didn't know that she had had her second child taken away. The father got custody of her, him. And that had happened fairly recently, and that she had went to meth uh, because of that. Um, well, not because of it, but kind of giving up too. So we were both these two suicidal people for like two or three months. We went to South Dakota because that was one of the reasons I got in an argument with my younger ex when we had her apartment is because she was like 19 and couldn't go to the casino so I was like well I'm gonna go anyway I've been planning this um so anyway you know that's kind of started a, that big argument and um but then it went with her I went with the junkie one to there and I had manifested previously that I was gonna win so we won like 1100 bucks and you know, we had a good time. Got to see the Yellowstone Crazy Horse again, which I wish they would get that finished, but without government funding, and it's taken a long time. Uh, yeah, we set a cave, saw a cave, saw some things like that. It's, you know, we really, I thought we were on the same page a lot. 
Oh, you know, but then in that honeymoon phase, you, you don't. And I, I kind of realized that I wasn't going to be with this person. Um, so I just kept it moderate. Like, we're not boyfriend, girlfriend. We can't be. We won't be. And about three months after that, I mean, it was it, time went by quick. We had all this. I mean, we was doing a ton of meth just fucking off and um then she tells me she's pregnant one night when I bought a bottle of booze and I was like no you're not bullshit like I really didn't believe her and she said she was and I was like no you're not you can't possibly be and she it, she took another month to actually go to the doctor <clears throat> and uh you know which not not cool for anybody to do um, but then I found out based on those tests that she had been pregnant a month before I met her and I, I noticed her gaining weight and boobs getting bigger and stuff but I figured it was just because we were eating out a lot um, so I knew it wasn't my kid even though you know she tried to pin it on me at first so I mean I'm going through a hell, all kinds of hell with this this girl and she was like 22 when I met her. She turned 23 right after I met her. <sighs> Something like that, I think so. And um, so then I was like, um, I don't know if I want to do this. But in my heart, I felt like I had had to be there for the kid that was inside of her. So a lot of a lot of craziness happened. Both. My old ex was still in town, and they both wanted to meet. And then it was like, just, oh my God, I'm not, like, what's going on here? These two young girls and me being like, this is not right somehow. This is not right. But not knowing any better and just saying, fuck it anyway. Well, you know, eventually my the younger one left. And I ended up staying with the junkie one and for the kid and stuff. And I left off and on. And that's when I, my friend that I met in Salt Lake told me to come to Hawaii. And he had a place. I could stay there. So I did that anyway. Got the ticket, all that. So I was ready to go for that. By that time, I had blown all the money. We had done all the drugs. Um... And I think she went pretty much sober throughout the pregnancy. And then when I got back from Hawaii, which somebody stole my wallet the day I was leaving Hawaii, and it was a non-refundable ticket, so I barely got on the plane. And then I made it to Portland, and I hiked the um, like an old Columbia Trail or something like that to Hood River. I made it to Hood River. Met up with my younger ex again. Um, which she prefers to be called a friend, not an ex. I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> but uh, um, so I stayed in Hood River for a, almost a month, a few weeks, trying to raise money, trying to get an ID, trying to get a bus ticket. Um, and then, you know, I got a bus ticket. Yeah, eventually got a bus ticket and worked the gardening with the older women that I had been working worked with years prior got a bus got made it back to valley city about a week after he was born but before he was born like four or five months after she was pregnant she said she or a few months beforehand she said she was going to name him oliver and i never told her that and um my other girlfriend she didn't know that either so i was like oh my goodness i have to stay I have to stay for this kid. This mom's not good. Um, and she knows that now. Um, so I stayed. And my mom and everybody else was like, what is wrong with you? It's not your kid. What are you doing? What are you doing? And I just felt in my heart I had to. I had to do this. I had to kind of make up for the, the childhood I had. I didn't want to see this kid growing up all in all these dramatic situations so I did my best to protect the kid to protect her from being dumb and doing super stuff and it wasn't that healthy but anyway we went into an apartment 
she got an apartment. I stayed. I babysat. I took care of Oliver. Oliver was I was like his mom and dad in a way, but I didn't. I was not gonna agree to working and taking care of everything like most dudes would. I mean, this whole shift of masculine feminine energies and I was way too masculine anyway at the time so she you know I helped her get a job at an open door center place where you take care of handicapped people and so she liked that I didn't really help her I just got her the application like pushed her towards it um, so she was work she would work and I would take care of the kid and it was good it was good for a while first year or so it was real good and learned about beat bugs. If you've ever watched beat bugs, it's uh, cartoons with um, bugs that sing Beatles songs. And me and Oliver were doing that. I mean, it was, I was happy. It was really happy. I mean, I was holding the kid. He would fall asleep on me way more than her and stuff. And it, she was very distant. It didn't seem like she really wanted to be a mom. I mean, she's young and. I mean, her, she had her first kid when she was like 18, and so very insecure, very insecure. Um, and so it was like, we'll never be a three, but we ended up being a three anyway, even though we weren't together. And we just kind of, it wasn't a friends with benefits thing either. It was more of a caretaker situation I was in. And so that lasted a couple of years, and I had gone to visit my dad few times you know we got into some arguments here and there it's like the way she was raised and the way I was raised clashed like massively and she was a Taurus son and I was Scorpio so that's like opposites in the astrology too I don't know if that makes much difference um, but after so long and we had moved got a different place and the Adderall too um, that was like not good she had a prescription for that, and so, just not good. And so one night, I had done a bunch of Adderall, and I was tired of babysitting. I was tired of being the guy to rely on, and her mom enabled the whole thing, too. I mean, we'd just go across the street to her mother's and get whatever we wanted, weed and stuff. So I was, like, using weed as a medication, and I was like, as long as you keep me high, I'll be all right. And... So it was very codependent in a very toxic way. Uh, she needed my help. I needed a place and to make sure Oliver was safe, to make sure things were good in that way, at least. But I would be cleaning and asking her. You know, I tried to be a good example as well. I stopped being as aggressive and bitchy at times. So she'd still do it, and so it just upset me. And then, well, one day after I was on Adderall, for a night or I think a night or so and I was like I'm not going to babysit no I'm not going to do that anymore and so Oliver had to go with her grandma or his grandma and um, to she wanted to bring her daughter to a dance recital or something right and so I came home and I got a couple of pissy messages but I didn't care and I had been spent the whole night digging through the floor, the carpets at this apartment, this trap house place. And, uh, you know, my nemesis guy, and a few other people were there. And, you know, when you're in a meth house, you, if you've never been to a meth house, you, you'd know. So I learned all about that. I had no idea what that scene was, what any of that shit was about. Half the time I was sober at these places, and most of them uh, were okay with it. Um, and so... I made my way back, and when I got back, Oliver was sick, and I really love this kid, right? I love him, love him, love him, and she left with the bottle, and the cats had been eating the, chewing the bottle tops and things, because you'd be leaving them everywhere. I mean, this is like, this is messy neglect we're talking here, and I couldn't keep up. I couldn't keep up, and eventually, and so after coming down off of that stuff, I was really moody in the first place. And so she came back and I just, I, I think I yelled in, as loud as I've ever yelled in my life. And all the kids, all three of her kids were there. I thought about hit, like choking her or hitting her or something, 
because she came to try to take Oliver out of my arms and I was like no and I put my arm up and so it, like hit her neck area and I thought about it I really honestly did but I didn't instead I hit the wall I did I didn't punch a hole in it or anything I just hit it and I was just like oh, finally trying to calm down and scraping this scraping her pipe which I guess was her first pipe ever and trying to get the last of the resin out just to calm down and um, then she, I was like what you want to hit me and she's like I do and I was like go for it so she did and I was like fine whatever but then the neighbor had called the cops and so the cops came and I answered the door and they kept, they took me out and I had put the pipe in my back pocket um, and you know I'm out of my mind by this time not real angry but the kids are crying and everything's just chaos and so the cops took me to jail I only spent a half hour in jail so you know the spirits definitely knew I was not a, that bad of a guy and later on I found out that the cops had asked her well one of you has to go to jail kind of thing and so I you know I was the one but um I tried to get the pipe out of my pocket, and they found it in the snow, and so I got charged with that too. But um, then the judge ordered a no contact, and so she she kept trying to get me to come back and call me a coward, all this kind of stuff. And I just got my stuff out of there, moved back into me with my mom, and she was okay with it at that time. Um, not really, but she's like, "You got thirty days." So in 30 days, I got a job at Subway because I wanted to be back with a social situation anyway and cleaned myself up. That's when I did the humorum cleanse. That's when I was super, super healthy. And then she got the no protection order taken off and I just risked it again. And I was like, well, I'm going to have to talk to her. Don't waste my time. So like the next day in court, she's like, can I have a hug and stuff? And I was like, well, okay. Um, like, I didn't want anything to do with her. I just wanted a happy family type situation, and she wasn't going along with it. Well, I talked to her that night. She gave me like two, three hours of promises, and we made deal breakers. I was like, if we could do Adderall anymore or these certain things anymore, I'm done. This is a deal breaker. And so that was that. And then I came back. My mom was like, it's just going to get worse. And I was like, I, I got to do it. I got to do it. I love the kid. I love the, the good times we had. We had a lot of good times, too. It wasn't all bad. Well, uh, then I decided to be in a relationship. I was like, well, maybe we'll be in a relationship. If we were in a relationship. Because she kept thinking I was going to leave. I, I mean, what I understood was that, oh, well, he's just going to leave anyway. I was, a, I'm very nomadic, you know, um, so, you know, I thought about, you know, being in a relationship, how that might help her, um, but honest, really though, she was just using me, even the cops told me that, everybody kept telling me that they were, she was just using me, and I didn't believe it, um, so anyway, uh, that's how that went. I remember Oliver looking at me like, well, are you going to ask her? Like, this little kid knew stuff, in a way. Um, maybe it was just me. But, so I went to visit my dad. And on the way back, I went to Project Earth by myself. And then she picked me up. And we went to Harmony, Minnesota. There's an underground cave, Niagara, Niagara Cave, they call it. I guess it was like one of the top 10 caves. There's a waterfall under there. There's like a little chapel. And that's when I asked her to marry me. Okay. And I just made a, a ring out of a joint because I mean, I don't believe in the marriage thing, especially after being forced to get married because of getting caught having sex. It was either get married or I had to leave. And it was like, no, let's just get married. You know? So. You know, I don't agree with the attachments. And in, like, the Toltec traditions, it's like you, you just can't give your star away. You have to l keep your star lit. 
And I didn't know about that stuff until like the last year, year and a half of starting to take care of myself that I have to have the cup, my cup full before I can spill it over to anyone else. And so I asked her to marry me. She said yes. Later on, I found out she was on Adderall when she said yes. And so it didn't count. It didn't count to me. And then I asked her again. And again, it was like, no. And so, I mean, there was a lot of deception going on. There had to be. I'm pretty sure of it. But my love for the family life and the, the kids and stuff like that, which Oliver was the only full-time kid. And, and I remember her saying one time, well, this well, her daughter has someone and her son has someone and Oliver doesn't have anyone. She tried to come guilt trip me into being there for Oliver and things like that and I, I told the, the real father which is probably the real father and he didn't believe it she lied to him again about that like she kept saying I don't like confrontation well she's a definitely definitely co covert narcissism juggler and very unhealthy okay so my unhealthy her unhealthy not healthy um Anyways, um, I finally had enough, and we were arguing and fighting all the time. That was just bad vibes. And so I decided to leave. Well, typical me, I had to make a statement on my way out. So I turned, left the water on when she, before she dropped me off in Fargo. After 10 years, I was going back to the New Life Center anyway because I was a 10-year cycle from when I first chose to go homeless. I wanted to see what would happen if I completed that cycle. And on that way, I f left the water running, so parts of the house flooded, I guess, and, you know, all that. And I had already done two CPS reports and because during that no contact, I did that first one, and the second one I did after I came to Fargo. So after I was out of that crappy town and all these negative flying monkeys, her mom saying that um, nobody, you're crazy anyway, nobody will believe you anyway, you're crazy anyway. Well, you know, later on I found out that she had done a CPS report on her anyway because she had started dealing meth and sh shooting it, she tells me, uh, you know, using needles with it and stuff. So it's like, I'm, now I guess Oliver's in a healthy foster family supposedly i i've kind of removed myself from it focused on me more um but like i said i'm just <laughs> this shattered operating system and final lessons and so when i went homeless i was in panic co constant panic uh survival mode just doing my best but i I went to peer support specialist training. The first week I was homeless, I got my phone back on. I'm usually pretty good at bouncing back. And started day labor work. And the next week I was in the Hilton doing peer support specialist training. And I even met someone tonight who mentioned how he met me there. And I've come a long way from there. Um, and then, so then I was homeless for a while and I guess, you know, the video's getting long again. So I'll finish with that. That was, that was a lot. I mean, there's plenty there. Um, it was both of our faults. And I'm just glad that, you know, her kids are hopefully in a healthy environment. Um, You know, of course, after that, I, you know, did that in another CPS kind of situation. And then, it, you know, 420 was the last time I did meth. And because I went back to Fingal, my hometown, and oh my God, that was a t shitty situation. Those guys, I, I loved them, but man, they were too way too far gone. That's a dead, dead town. So, I'll just end in there. I, I got healthy again that December of 2018. And January, I had my first panic attack, I remember. Um, 
it's kind of tough to just figure out. But I was in constant flow state due to survival reasons, mostly. And just not knowing what to do and trying to run away from all the pain and the resentments, the hurts. So I just focused on me. But not really. That's what these last four months have been about. It's really focusing on me. So I'm just getting into that point. So I'm going to leave this one on that and I'll clarify this one and then I should be done with these <laughs> shattered operating systems and from the 12 years of my coma, a little more than 12 years now, September 6th through September 10th was when I was in the coma. You know, it's been a hell of a journey. Um, So, listen to your gut, I guess. Except for me, I'm a little bit rebellious in that sense too. Like, I've purposely went back into shitty situations just to know better, just to figure it out. Even though I knew better, I knew it was going to be hard, I did it anyway. And I'm glad that I learned things it's kind of like you you won't know if the stove's hot unless you actually touched it so i actually touched a lot of hot things i burned myself over and over and over and i'm through doing that i'm looking to being more of a influence inspiring influence now so i'm just kind of getting all of this out like i said i guess my body and stuff has still have a lot of trauma dealing with it and we've all been through trauma and one of the best things about that peer support specialist thing was instead of shooting on everyone because I thought I knew this better or that better that it's more about asking them you know what do you want what do you really want and then things might have been different um, you can oh, we can always say that but I send blessing balls of light to everybody um, a lot of times I've prayed, a lot of times for her, for all of her. I used to have prayer requests at that Lighthouse Church, the Recovery Church. So, it's really still pretty hard. <laughs> well, this is the end of episode 11 of A Minute with Mud. And uh, mud shattering operating, mud shattered operating system phase four, which I'll clarify in another video. Peace, love, blessings. I'll see what kind of information I can share on the healings of this and reach out. I guess if you feel like reaching out. Until then, peace, love, blessings, take care of yourself and others. Volunteering has helped me out a whole lot. I had like 30 homeless friends thinking I was peer supporting when I really I was using codependency and trying to feel good about doing good for my own self-worth. Well, that is not real self-worth. And that's what I've been learning. So, peace, love, affection.